My topic is the exact opposite of multiculturalism, the defense of majority culture. It is indeed true that the concept of minority logically implies and asks for that of majority. Only what is it? It certainly isn't a legal concept. And precisely the quest for making it a legal concept makes it patently clear that it cannot be one. The Jewish-Israeli case, which I suspect motivates the entire inquiry, is the exception to the rule. There has been an interesting and, I think, fascinating debate among Israeli intellectuals whether Israel is a normal nation-state, say, as France is French. Of course, it is not. This is already obvious in the fact that there are two words around to describe the Jewish nation-state, Israel for the object and Jewish for the quality or the adjectival form of it. In France, there's only one root word, France and French. The legal constitutional formula, Jewish and democratic, is a trick to hide that fact. It is the liberals' ruse to make Israel as French as France. It does not work. And irrespective, uh, irrespectively of the extremist religious nationalist agenda that drives this campaign, I find it entirely logical, also honest, if that word is the right one here, to slash the democratic and just call Israel the Jewish state. But what is French? If it is categorically different from Jewish. One interesting proposition is to call it dominant ethnicity. Eric Kaufmann, a colleague at Birkbeck College, has proposed that. It doesn't work. French or Germans, whatever they are, are not ethnic origin groups. They do not share a belief in common descent, which is Max Weber's definition of ethnicity, still the most widely used and plausible in the literature. Proof to this is liberal and ever more liberalized nationality laws, as a result of which you have the painful spectacle of German footballers who do not know to sing or do not want to sing even the politically correct third verse of the national anthem. If French or German isn't ethnic, what is it? They are adjectival forms of French or German passport holders who can be of any ethnicity, who may even think, to go back to the football example, that Erdogan is their sultan. French or German are merely the cultural shells of democracy, cultural shells that, due to a liberal democratic logic, have become as elastic, as permeable, and also as tasteless as a slice of American Wonder Bread. An interesting but futile rescue operation to give some demographic sociological flash to the empty signifiers French or German is the Dutch category of autochton as against allochton. This denotes people whose parents were born in the same country. However, in the context of liberally open nationality laws, and the Dutch is an example of that, this still allows, even it calls for, the Mesut Özil phenomenon. So we are back to square one of French and German as empty signifiers, mere conventions to denote the boundaries of the demos, more precisely, of demoi in the plural. From a liberal point of view, it is impossible to conclude from the existence and endorsement of minority rights that there must be majority rights also. 
which is one way, paradoxically, the liberal way to make majority a legal reality. This is a logical fallacy. It misconstrues the nature of a right, a trump card against majority preferences. Majorities, by definition, have the democratic process at their disposal. They don't need the legal process, which is the domain of rights. Now, having said that, while this is the liberal end of the matter, it is not the end of the matter in the real world. In the real world, the defense of majority culture is not only one. No, it is the central preoccupation of our current populist moment, epitomized by the double Brexit and Trump shock of 2016. Moment is a misnomer for what is happening. It is a kind of wishful thinking because the nature of a moment is to go away quickly. What is really happening has deeper roots, more far-reaching implications. In reality, what we are witnessing is the rebellion of those who are in the relatively unlucky 75th to 90th percentile region of Branko Milanovic's famous elephant curve. This is a graph that measures the global income gains between 1988 and 2008, the period commonly referred to as globalization. In this unlucky percentile range, there has been little or no income growth over the past quarter century. Its occupants are the much-touted losers of globalization. Still relative losers, because globally speaking, they are an upper class, the lower Western lower middle class and working class. The heart of the grievance is economic. In an interesting, it is an interesting fact, however, that the grievance comes to be expressed in cultural terms. In a kind of psychic goal displacement, it is less the economic elites and the neoliberalism that they inflected on their societies that is being attacked here. No, these elites and their neoliberalism, they have managed to hide themselves, to shield, to shield themselves behind the famous Tina diction. There is no alternative, Margaret Thatcher's famous word. Tina was incidentally ratified by so-called third-way social democrats and socialists who brought their parties into the dinosaur phase. And rightly so, because Thatcher in trousers, which is a word for Tony Blair, is an ungainly sight. No, not the economic elites or the capitalist class is blamed for the low trunk region on the elephant curve and for the Western countries' lower middle class plight. Instead, it is immigrants, especially Muslims, who are blamed, and less as an economic threat, which they are not objectively, so there's an element of smartness here. No, they are attacked as a cultural threat, and the nature of a cultural threat is to be all in the eye of the beholder. It is worthwhile to look at an interesting recent document that is a reflection on why populism. It is written by Alexander Gauland, who is the leader of the German alternative for Germany, Germany's right-wing party in uh, parliament today. And interestingly, it was published in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. According to Gauland's entirely plausible analysis, and I submit the professional sociologist could not add a iota of insight into this. According to Gauland, populism is a response to the rise of a new urban elite, a globalized class that controls economy, politics, and culture. This new class is culturally varied, bunt, says Gauland, it contains the liberal professionals that propagate 
multiculturalism and anti-discrimination, but it contains also the neoliberal free marketeers for whom diversity means business. Socially, however, this class is homogenous, says Gauland. Its members effortlessly change jobs and places from Berlin, London to Singapore. They eat in the same restaurants, buy in the same shops, live in the same hip parts of creative cities, send their children to private, of course, international schools, and occasionally have nice weekends in Rome. The rain that falls in their home countries does not make them wet. A beautiful, poetic line by Alexander Gauland. Interestingly, there is little mention in Gauland's story that extreme economic distress, apart from miserably paid jobs and shabby pensions for ordinary people after a hard uh, life of uh, uh, a lot of work, there is no mention or very little mention of the economic distress of the people who rebel against the new class. And here also is an element of profound sociological truth. It is the case that those who vote for his party and similar parties elsewhere, they are not the very poor. They are not the unemployed. These people don't go voting anyway. It is rather those who, poor in education and not really movable to take advantage of globalization, they have seen others suffer from globalization, often in rural and uh, uh, de-industrializing backwaters. It is more the fear of than actual losses from globalization that drives radical right parties. Instead of economic distress, cultural distress is central to Gauland's autoanalysis of populism. To be snubbed by a cosmopolitan elite for the provincialism of the lower people, to crave for the heimat, the home that is threatened by immigrants. Interestingly, immigrants are mentioned only one time and obliquely at that as if Gauland wanted to hide something ugly from a learned audience, because dahinter steckt immer ein kluger Kopf, is the logo of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. In reality, of course, immigrants, more precisely refugees, are the one big theme of AfD, Alternative for Deutschland, to whom this party owes its very entry into the Bundestag last September. Or seven, yeah, last September it was, in 2017. One critic counted no, lo, no less than 290 parliamentary motions, Anfragen, since uh, September 2017. Connect everything to refugees and the asylum issue, and uh, to depict the Federal Republic as in the thrall of unregulated mass immigration. This is the AfD and similar uh, right-wing parties' recipe of success. The disjunction between Gauland's self-analysis of populism, which barely mentions immigrants, and its actual practice, the actual practice of populism, which is about little else but immigrants, that suggests that Gauland is aware of what he's doing, scapegoating refugees and immigrants and let go the elites that are responsible for letting them in. There are two more interesting nuances and insights in Gauland's inquiry into the origins of Western populism and their majority defense. First, the multiculturalists are put into one camp with the neoliberals, socially and politically speaking. This is an interesting proposition that naturally deviates from how the liberal multiculturalists like to see themselves as opposed to what Will Kimlicker has denounced as corporate multiculturalism. In reality, neoliberal capitalism has long absorbed the multiculturalist opposition. For this stands the ubiquitous diversity and interculturalism rhetoric. Neoliberalism 
is no longer aligned with ham-handed traditional nationalism, as it may have been in the early days of Thatcher and Reagan. Neoliberalism is a term that I actually prefer to populism, is now the main opposition to uh, neoliberalism. So it's neo nationalism, the main opposition to neoliberalism, at least in our Western countries. That is the first interesting insight, among many others, of course. The second one I would like to point in the end. Gauland has seen that the opposition to the new globalized class, uh, which actually has absorbed or flattened the old traditional left-right distinction, it can only be a fundamental opposition. And this opposition can be either left or right. Necessarily, it has to be populist. He got it right. The essence of populism is to be anti-elite, which also links its current expressions with the relative loss position on the elephant curve. The only thing that uh, Germany's chief populist uh, is silent about is that in its right-wing or neo-nationalist var variant, the populist impulse gets deflected from countering the elites and their neoliberal model. I will not say more on that um, and want to close with one remark about how the story gets really interesting when mainstream parties, particularly center-right parties and the governments uh, that are formed by center-right uh, uh, center party, when they poach on that theme of majority, cultural majority uh, defense. And there's a fascinating, that's indeed my last word here, fascinating recent example. The former German interior minister, Thomas de Maziere, published 10 theses about a German light kultur, appositely not in the FATS, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, but in the Bild Zeitung, which is a tabloid. This is an obvious attempt to take the theme of majority defense away from the radical right. And uh, the radical right, which of course has risen exactly after the Syrian refugee crisis. And predictably, it turned out to be one big failure. It founded on the rock of liberalism. So I close my circle here. The impossibility of majority defense from a liberal perspective. The starting point of de Maziere is entirely plausible. Just a thin legal constitutional verfassungspatriotism may not be enough to hold a society together. On its premises, Quebec would never want to leave Canada. Therefore, there has to be something more, something informal, something cultural that keeps us together in the innermost, im innersten Zusammenhalt, writes de Maizière. The light culture, only deficiently translated actually as dominant culture, because lighten is more pastoral than domineering. And upon this follows a decalogue, 10 theses of things that keep Germans together in their innermost, apart and beyond thin legal uh, 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 constitutional patriotism. To shake hands, not to wear Burka. Wir sind nicht Burka is the clumsy title of this intervention. It actually has the smell of German construction workers, monkey Turkish. Ali, mir holen ein Bier. Secondly, in this Decalo, there is a pension for Kultur and Bildung. Thirdly, in this Decalo, Leistung. That is very interesting because that's the only neoliberal entry into otherwise a typically uh, Bundesrepublikanisch list. Um, religion. Interestingly, here in De Maziere's version, liberal elite version, of course. Religion, in perfect political correctness, is not only the church variant, but also the synagogue or the mosque variant. And then there are five or six more inconvertible things, all of which uh, decisively are not exclusively German, in confirming that there is not, that there cannot be an exclusively German light culture 
this decalogue is already self-defeating. However, the most important sentence is at the end. Can the light culture be legally prescribed? Asks de Maizière. Is it mandatory? No, of course, demonstrates the impossibility of a legal defense of majority culture in the still liberal state.